should happen is kind of beside the point. I just want to, um, you know, sort of explain how we got here. That's my goal. So, um, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, things are changing all the time. But, um, all right, so let's start. Um, who are the Slavs? Great question, Ross. Um, well, uh, they're Indo-European peoples uh, who speak uh, Slavic languages, of course. Originally from the Vistula River Valley, uh, and they migrated to today's Russia in um, something like the 600s at various times. Others came from the Caucasus, others came from Scandinavia, and, uh, Indo and Russian is a, a Slavic language. All these Slavic languages are Indo-European languages, which means they're related to Germanic and Romance and Indic languages and so on. Um, the main Slavs that we're talking about here are the East Slavs, the Russians, the Ukrainians, and the Belarusians. Uh, their languages have a lot in common. They're fairy tales and folk tales and material culture, all kinds of things. They have, you know, Russians have a lot in common with other Slavs, but the East Slavs are more are closer linguistically and culturally in a lot of ways than the West Slavs. The East Slavs tend to be Orthodox Christians, the West Slavs tend to be uh, Catholic, um, and so uh, a lot of differences, but a lot of similarities as well. Um, the early years, um, by the way, these maps are not actual size. Uh, the, um, uh, so in 862, these Russian princes invited a Scandinavian prince of Rurik to come rule over them, and Kiev became uh, sort of a first among equals of a bunch of principalities uh, there are 12 of them ultimately in basically the sort of original heartland of Russia. Kiev down here in the south was the sort of the most important city and the prince of Kiev was the grand prince. Uh, about 100 years later, the grand prince of Kiev took Orthodox Christianity. So he Christianized all of Rus. And so that meant that all of these East Russian lands were Orthodox Christian. Uh, and gradually uh, over the next couple centuries, uh, uh, Kiev expanded its power particularly north and east. Uh, and uh, in, in the map that looks like this, so, you know, starting around, let's say, the, 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 you know, around 800 or so, starting here, and then gradually expanded. They're on the Dnieper River, which is an important uh, boundary and, and sort of main artery, uh, big trade route, and so on. It's also important to point out that in this period between like 900 and 1200, this is when the Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, this original East Slavic people, started to split and become three different peoples with linguistic differences and cultural differences. Still a lot in common, but they started to uh, kind of separate from one another. Uh, so Kiev is growing between 700 and about 1240, when the Mongols come and destroy Kiev and spend the next 250 years sort of subjugating uh, all of the Russian principalities, demanding tribute and really cutting them off from Europe. Kiev resisted and was destroyed. Moscow, however, uh, was smarter and uh, uh, basically paid off the Mongols because the Mongols were really just about tribute. And so they repeatedly they, you know, paid tribute on a regular basis, but that meant that they survived this occupation much better. And so when the Mongols were finally kicked out in 1480, Moscow emerged as the center of Russian power. So that's how original East Slavic power migrated from Kiev to Moscow over a couple hundred years. Um, later, much later, in the late 1700s, Catherine the Great went to war against the Ottoman Empire and took a lot of this area here north of the Black Sea around the Crimean Peninsula and what's now sort of southeastern Ukraine, southwestern Russia, uh, calling this area Nova Russia or New Russia and this area Mala Russia or Little Russia, which makes sense because originally the East Slavs were divided between the Great Russians, the Little Russians, and the White Russians. So in the Russian perspective, we're all just Russians. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. 
Um, and so Russia starts to absorb more land, uh, but looks to focus on Ukraine. So here's a, a map of some of this absorption. This is what I'm talking about. This is new Russia. This is where am I? This is new Russia, and this is little Russia um, in the 16 and 1700s, especially the late 1700s. Um, going way forward into history, the Soviet Union was established in 1917, and as a result of the Union Treaty of 1922, um, the Soviets created this union of 15 republics. And each republic had boundaries and sort of a republic party and administration, but really everything was just governed by Moscow. Right? It's not like in this country where we have a federal government with a lot of power, but state governments also have a lot of power. Um, this was different. You had these, these republics, but really Moscow held all the power with the Communist uh, Party. And so here's the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. The big red one is the Russian uh, Socialist Republic. And so it's one big united uh, country. And this is the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, this area here, which is roughly the same as modern Ukraine. Although look, Crimea is not included in the original map. But then, in 1954, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the head of the Soviet Union, gave Crimea to Ukraine, which at the time meant nothing, because that's, you know, again, we're all one country, it doesn't really matter. And he was Ukrainian, and it was kind of like, all right, let's do this fun thing, who cares? It doesn't matter. But Putin looks at this now and says, that was a catastrophe and a crime and a violation of international law, and that's why we took back Crimea. By we, I mean Putin, not he and I. Anyway, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. In 1954, Crimea was just given to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, um, really for no real reason. And at the time, they thought, who cares? Um, also, in the, Soviet, in the Cold War, remember, the Soviet Union and its uh, partner states in the uh, Warsaw Pact, right? You've got East versus West and uh, communism versus, uh, you know, capitalism, democracy, all that stuff, just to remind you. But, you know, look at this map of the Soviet Union. There's no Ukraine, there's no Belarus, there's no Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. This is all one big country. So these internal divisions for the Soviets, really, they don't matter in the Soviet period. Well, until 1991, when the Soviet Union disintegrates, and Ukraine becomes, uh, a, for really the first time ever, an independent country. And so now, Crimea, which was given to Ukraine in the 50s, who cares? Now, that's become another country. So that's a big deal. All the nuclear weapons that the Soviets had put in Ukraine, because that's close to the West, were now Ukrainian nuclear weapons. So they lost all these nuclear weapons. They lost access to oil and coal and the Dnieper River and all these trade routes and, and, and everything that they had built, bases and so on. So that was a great loss for the Soviet Union because that whole massive unified country broke up into 15 separate uh, uh, countries. Um, and the Soviets saw this as just a trauma, as a terrible disaster. Um, and many of these former Soviet republics and former Warsaw Pact communist countries became members of the EU, became members of NATO, and the Soviets, the Russians, saw this as a look at the West. They won the Cold War and now they're creeping in, right? They're taking over the people who used to be our friends because they want to restrict Russia and keep it under control and they're, they want to victimize us. So why is, what is Putin's argument? Uh, first of all, he says, Russians and Ukrainians are just one people. We have the same language, we have the same culture, uh, there's no difference. Our history goes back to Kiev. I mean, Kiev is really where any notion of a united Russia began in Kiev, that's clear. So, Great Russia, Little Russia, and White Russia are really just all one big Russia. We're really just one people, is his first point. Another point is that we have one faith, we're all Orthodox Christians, right? So we're all the same in that respect. We speak the same language. Ukrainians say, no, Ukrainians is a different language, and Putin says, no, they're the same language. Um, he says, we have really old, long-standing economic ties that have benefited you, the Ukrainians, for a long time, and it's what the people want. The people who live there don't see themselves as Ukrainian, and, and, and when we hear that they do, those are just agitators or neo-Nazis, we'll get to that, or foreigners putting these ideas in people's heads. Really, the people want to be united with their Russian brothers. So that's the sunny side of Putin's argument. Um, oh, and just looking at his language uh, thing, he looks at the name for Ukraine, which is Ukraina, and he translates it, I think, pretty accurately, as being related to Ukraina, which means it's the periphery, it's, it's the land on the edge of our territory. So it's not a separate country with a separate name, a separate meaning, a separate identity, it's just the, for her, it's the borderlands, but it's our borderlands. So he looks to language to make that point. He also says Ukrainian is just a dialect of Russian, it's not a separate language. And he says Russia is to Ukraine as Rome is to Brezhnev, which 
Anyway, um, you know, in the 19th century, when the Germans and the Italians unified, not together, but you know, German unification, Italian unification, there was this strong conviction that, look, Italy, for example, has all these regions with linguistic differences and cultural differences, but we're all Italian, so let's get together and have one big Italian state. That's Putin's view of Russia and Ukraine. That it's just different regions. We're really the same thing. And he says any language differences that people point to are because, well, because the people in that part of the world have been ruled by Poles and Lithuanians and Germans and the Austro-Hungarians, and so they've sort of colluded the language. So that's why they're a little, you know, misled. But really, it's all the same language. Uh, anyway, and you can see their alphabets are indeed very similar, uh, with some, you know, important differences. Okay, uh, Putin also says, look, we're good for you, Ukraine. We're your we're your number three trade partner. We're worth eighty-two billion dollars to you a year. Uh, which I have no idea if this is true, but this is his, this is I didn't have time to research all these facts. Uh, but this is his <laughs> argument. Um, also, you know, Russia is one of the largest gas suppliers in the world, and they supply Europe with gas through these pipelines. The pipelines that go through Ukraine, Ukraine gets money to host this pipeline as gas is transferred through its country, and that, according to Putin, earns Ukraine a billion and a half a year. So he's like, look, our relationship is good for you. Why would you? Why would you want to be separate from us and turn to the West? All right, so that's all the sunny side, right? Hey, we're brothers, we help you, you like us, we're all the same. The gloomy side of his argument are five main points. Number one is that the political boundaries are artificial, they're arbitrary, it's nonsense. I'll, I'll cover all these, each of these individuals. Number two, um, the, the breakup of the Soviet Union was a trauma, it was a crime, it was a robbery, it was a terrible thing, and that needs to be rectified. Number three, uh, since the breakup, Russians, ethnic Russians have been uh, uh, oppressed, and there's sort of a low-level ethnic cleansing going on against Russians in Ukraine. Again, all of this, I'm not justifying any of this, just, that's what he's saying. Uh, and in Ukraine, there's a lot of ha hatred of Russians and hatred of Orthodox Christians. Number four, uh, the West hates Russia. Uh, the United States, the EU, uh, NATO, all they want to do is, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, they won the Cold War, and so they want to keep us hemmed in and go after us and limit us and marginalize us and make us feel small. And uh, I mean, does anyone, I, I'm thinking Germany 1933, but anyway, and so therefore we want to, you know, we need to rise up against this because there's a big conspiracy against us. And number five, Ukraine stinks. It's a failed state. It's corrupt. Its economy's in the tank. It's terrible. To which I would say, well, forget it. I, I would say. Number one, let's go to the borders. Um, all right, so he points out that in 1922, in the Soviet Union, Union Treaty, Lenin and the Bolsheviks drew these borders of these republics, which really, according to Putin, didn't matter. Because the Soviet Union was a revolution of workers and peasants. And it didn't matter what your language was, what your ethnicity was, what religion you were, because religion didn't matter anymore, right? Religion's the opiate of the masses. So all people in this massive region are rising up and saying, we're together, we're one, and we're not gonna be oppressed by the church, the monarchs, the nobles anymore, and we're gonna govern ourselves because that's the masses. Um, and so the borders were really just fake, like who cares? And it was sort of to give the appearance of, look, the Lithuanians love being part of the Soviet Union, the Georgians love it, the Estonians love it, the Kazakhs love it, but it was really just a sham to make it look like, look, the people of the world are joining hands for communism. But really, in terms of Russia and Ukraine, it's just one people. Um, so the borders are meaningless. Uh, and, and he says that, you know, when the Soviet Union broke up, he quotes uh, the mayor of St. Petersburg at the time who said, when you leave, take with you what you brought. So look, Ukraine, if you're gonna leave the Union, you should take with you what you brought, which is like, let's go back to Ukraine before you join the Union. And that Ukraine pretty much, there really was no Ukraine. So the point being, you only exist because we made you, so you're not going anywhere. Anyway, so that's Putin. Uh, that's about the borders. Uh, number two, this is about the breakup being traumatic, and I probably can't really emphasize this enough. I think in the West, you know, the, the victory in the Cold War with the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the breakup of the Soviet Union are huge successes and like an achievement for freedom and equality and democracy and humankind. In Russia, this is largely seen as a terrible, terrible tragedy uh, because Russia lost power, prestige, wealth, nuclear weapons, access to natural resources. They went from being a superpower, to, I mean, they lost over half their population to being, you know, just sort of an afterthought, a second-rate power. And that was devastating, and that led to over a decade, the 1990s, of um, 
economic disaster, political failures, and Russia just being a joke. And that was awful. And when Putin came to power, he said, I'm going to make Russia great again. Um, anyway, so, uh, and, and when the Soviet Union broke up, all the ethnic Russians who lived in all these other republics had been enjoying a dominant position. Now they're in the minorities. And according to Putin, the Estonians were discriminating against the ethnic Russians left behind. The Ukrainians were discriminating against the ethnic Russians. And so there's this great resentment of you know, all these Russians left behind who were now suffering and being oppressed by their new overlords. Um, he also says, um, you know, he's also mad that their old East European Warsaw Pact members joined NATO, a lot of them, and the EU. Um, what, you don't want to have a relationship with them anymore? What happened? We used to be friends. Why are you joining those guys? Um, and then foreigners came in and plundered natural resources like uh, diamonds and so on. I don't have time to get into that, but the main point is that the West loves it. The West delighted in our downfall and in our suffering, and that's terrible, and we're going to show that. Point number three, that Russians are oppressed in Ukraine. He points to a recent language law uh, that says that uh, print media and their associated uh, digital media have to be in Ukrainian, or if there's a Russian version, there has to, if it's in Russian, there has to be like a parallel Ukrainian version. Um, he points to the fact that two thirds of Ukrainian citizens, and again, actually that's that I found some uh, The two thirds of Ukrainian citizens claim Russian as their primary native language. Uh, and he says, look, Ukrainian, but Ukrainian is the official language of schools, of education, um, of, of media, and um, again, this is oppressing, this is making Russians into second class citizens, ethnic Russians, into second class citizens in Ukraine, and it, it's making it a, you're, 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 you're shamed and, and, and marginalized if you speak Russian or want to celebrate Russian culture. And um, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church also just a few years ago kind of separated from the Moscow church hierarchy and became its own entity. You know, within the larger Orthodox Church, but still. And so Putin looks at that and says, oh, and now the Ukrainian Orthodox have been going around seizing Russian Orthodox churches and beating up priests and monks and their terrible atrocities against uh, Russian Orthodox clergy and believers in Ukraine. Again, these are all Putin's claims. I didn't have time to, to verify these, but maybe Mr. Smith will look into it for me. Point number four, <laughs> the West hates Russia and has long plotted against them. He, he, he details a whole list of, of of offenses by Poland that I won't get into. The Austro-Hungarian and German empires in World War I sort of invented Ukrainian nationalism as a way to weaken Russia. Of course, they were fighting against Russia in World War I. Uh, and then uh, I mentioned the Soviet Union sort of creating this false notion of a Ukraine. Um, and then people who hate Stalin point to the famine, the result of collectivization in the 1930s. And, and people say, well, Stalin tried to you know, commit a genocide against the Ukrainian people. And for Putin, that's all nonsense. There was no Ukrainian people. Collectivization had its problems. Sure, some people died, but no one's trying to kill Ukrainians because we love Ukrainians because they're the same as us. Uh, so in the Cold War, of course, the US and NATO threatened Russia with their nuclear weapons and their alliances. Um, and then after the Cold War, those ranks grew and marginalized us and threatened us even more. And he's claiming that the United States and the EU have direct control over Ukraine, that Ukraine, really, the Ukrainian government is just a puppet of the West and will do whatever they want. And that's terrible because everyday Ukrainians, who are early Russians, really feel more affinity with Russia and want to join with them. And, and then, so it's point number five, that your, Ukraine is a failed state. He calls them Europe's poorest country, which I kind of think is probably not true, but he claims it. I don't have time. Uh, and he says, uh, look, your economy's terrible, your GDP is down, uh, and uh, your, your, your uh, politicians and oligarchs are corrupt. They're stealing money and putting it in Western banks. Um, and oh, and by the way, you're also super cozy with neo-Nazis, who of course we hate because we fought against them in World War II. And so Ukraine is just a breeding ground for neo-Nazis and, and a pawn of the West, and uh, uh, it's just a land of oppression and incompetence. And um, uh, anyway, so that's a lot that's going on. So just to catch you up on some recent history, oh, this one passed my thought. Uh, in 2004 and five was the Orange Revolution, uh, where this guy, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, defeated this guy, Viktor Yushchenko, uh, in a presidential election. Um, and uh, then it, it, it immediately came out that there was massive allegations of voter fraud, um, uh, corruption, uh, and, and uh, 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 just, just all kinds of uh, shenanigans. And, and the, the exit polls didn't match the actual results. Like the exit polls showed that this guy won. But the, anyway, so this guy's super conservative. This guy's more of a European minded reformer. Anyway, so there were these massive protests in. Um, Kiev and throughout the country, and the parliament didn't like it either because they said, hey, you know, we don't like this guy, and we want a free and fair election. So then there was a revote 
with international observers, you know, like you see sometimes in other countries, saying, yes, this was a free and fair election. And this time, the good guy for the West won, Yanukovych. Um, and so, uh, but, but Putin looks at this and says, you know, this Yanukovych, the eventual winner, was a Western a friend of the West. And this guy was more conservative and Easter looking. And so this was an example of the West moving in and putting, making sure their guy, you know, oh, it's not a fair election. We're going to redo it. And then the West sort of put their thumb on the scale and got their guy elected, according to Putin. Uh, in 2014, you may have heard of the Maidan, which is the main square in uh, Kiev, the Revolution of Dignity. This is where um, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, who, uh, if you'll notice, uh, had been elected and then not, but then he came back, he got elected again. There's a whole, let's not get into that. Anyway, um, Ukraine was moving towards signing a deal with the EU that was going to be a political association deal and a free trade deal because Ukraine wanted to... Um, you know, have closer ties with Western Europe uh, for a variety of reasons. Well, Viktor Yanukovych, the president, far left, was about to sign it, and then suddenly he didn't sign it. And so there was a there were massive protests. The parliament was upset. People turned out literally by the millions in the streets. It was a massive deal. And then the government, controlled by the president, um, there were like these sniper squads that started shooting people. If you have Netflix, there's a pretty good documentary called The Winter War about this. I guess what it's called. Or, Fire in winter, that's what's called, fire in winter. Anyway, the government was shooting peaceful civilian protesters in the square, and of course this made people even more and more upset, and finally Yanukovych, the president, just fled, guess where? Russia. To Russia. He fled to Russia, and a new president was elected and signed the deal, and Russia said, this is a coup, right? So Ukraine's leaders are now not legitimate, and it's because it was all orchestrated by the West because they want Ukraine to be in their orbit and they don't want Russia to have a relationship with Ukraine. And so this is another thing that he looks at and says, see, the West is pulling the strings. We need to rectify this. Um, 2019, Zelensky, who's the current president, was elected. Okay, so uh, in 2014, Russia, Putin's had enough and he moves in. First, he sends two troops to Crimea. Um, these are the little green men you may have heard about. They were soldiers in you know, army uniforms that had no markings and no symbols, and nobody knew, you know, I mean, there's suspicion that it was right, but who are these people? Eventually he admitted they were Russian troops, but it, it, the idea was to, well, Putin said that th this is a, a spontaneous uprising of Russians in Crimea saying, we want to join Russia. So these little green men moved in, took over the Ukrainian military, not that powerful, couldn't stop them, and then they had this referendum, they had like a week notice before this referendum, uh, there was an 83% turnout and 97% in the referendum voted to join Russia. So he just took Crimea. The United States imposed sanctions, the West imposed sanctions, but nothing else. So now he's got Crimea. And then uh, later that year, he sends troops into Luhansk and Donetsk, these eastern regions, uh, and the fighting begins, and it's really been going on, I mean, even before this week. It's been going on and off for about eight years. And Putin again says, look, the people here fighting against the Ukrainian government are local volunteers. This is a spontaneous you know, uprising of people to express the will of the people. This, we're not involved. This isn't us. We're not fomenting this. We're not doing it. It's people. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, Russians who want Ukraine to be uh, closer to Russia at the very least. So then uh, international involvement got these two deals in Minsk, uh, the so-called Minsk deals, um, that uh, tried to stop the fighting and set up a let's work this out before this gets into a big war. It was never implemented. Uh, neither side really liked the deal that much, and um, of course Putin blames Ukraine, Ukraine blames Putin, um, but um, it was supposed to stop the fighting and it didn't work out. So if you hear him talking about Minsk, he's talking about this deal that was supposed to stop it, but didn't. All right, so in the very latest, in 2019, uh, Putin issued passports to the people in these, in these regions, in these eastern regions, uh, and then just this week on Monday, Putin recognized those two republics as independent states, and... When he did that, he, he said, well, the Donetsk Republic is this area, when really this was just the area where the soldiers were, right? And Luhansk is this area. So these darker areas were Ukrainian-held territory by the Ukrainian military. And so when he recognized those larger pieces as independent states, like a day later, he said, and Ukrainian soldiers are in these independent states that I've just declared. And so therefore, we're going to liberate these people. So, um, so Russia invaded, of course, as you know, 24 hours ago, and the United States and the West are starting to impose some pretty heavy sanctions. 
uh, one big thing to keep in mind is that you know Ukraine had was clearly moving toward the West before this in political economic relationships and the West uh, and Ukraine also um, you know there were some indications that Ukrainians wanted to join NATO um, and uh, uh, but Putin of course said I'll never accept that because again the West is just creeping ever closer to us and taking off all of our old you know picking off all of our own friends and we're not going to let that happen anymore so um, so, so now it's clear that like if, if the West said, okay, Ukraine's gonna join NATO, that would then obligate the West to NATO to fight Russia, right? Because it's a mutual defense pact, and if one of your partners is being, members is being attacked, you have to respond. So there's sort of this notion now, like, well, maybe Ukraine will never get to join NATO because who wants to go to war with Russia? And it's also important to keep in mind that Joe Biden has said we will not send troops to Ukraine, which already takes like our biggest weapon off the table. Uh, and so Putin knows that, you know, the, the consequence, the negative consequences of this will probably just be financial. So that's kind of all I have. Um, so to, I don't know what's gonna happen, uh, at, but um, but just to summarize, uh, I think Putin is, um, you know, he, he sees Russia as a deeply aggrieved people and country that the West is conspiring against, uh, and Ukraine is, is a fiction. Uh, I'll also tell you, I've spoken to a lot of Russians over the last 10 years, and everyone I've talked to, like all the Russians in Russia, I mean, every single one, regardless of education level, to live in the city or country, everyone says, of course Ukraine is Russia. It's ridiculous. This whole notion of an independent, country, independent Ukraine is a fiction. These borders aren't real. That government is a sham. And we're all, we're all one people. They go back to the East Slavic roots. They go back to you know the Soviet Union and drawing lines and who cares? We're just all one thing. So this is just restoring to Russia. This is true. I think a lot of Russians really feel that way. Also, it's important to keep in mind that Putin really controls the media and you know any messaging out there. But the, the, just in my limited experience, Russians really seem to believe that, that those are just our people. And why would we be separate? And why would they want to be Western? The West is not about us. So um, I think that's a that's a widely held view. Um, also, I'm kind of suspicious of things now because I got an email from a really good friend in St. Petersburg who went on this rant saying everything that I've just said and uh, about how no one wants war and it's Uncle Sam playing these mind games and pulling the strings and it's all Americans' fault and, and I'm not blaming you personally, you're my friend, but America's terrible. And this whole rant and, and I, thought I was like a third of the way into the email and I thought like, is this really my friend? Like is this, I don't know, is this some kind of bot? So now I'm like worried that everything I do on a computer like even this presentation, I, I, you know, I don't know. Is Putin gonna find out? I don't know. I probably shouldn't be so narcissistic as to think he would care, but I just, it makes me cry. So uh, anyway, again, uh, I'm not justifying anything, but I think it's important to understand why Putin would want U uh, Ukraine, why Russians would think that Ukraine is rightfully theirs, and why the West is so demonized there. Uh, you know, there were the the the. Um, Sanctions after 2014, after Russia took Ukraine, uh, sorry, after Russia took Crimea, and I went to Russia in the summers of 2015 and 16, and there were like old school, like World War One, World War Two era type propaganda posters. It was crazy. I've only seen these like in pictures. I've never really seen them. Propaganda posters about like the West will never make us bow down. Their sanctions won't hurt us. And there were like, I mean, like you've seen like World War One propaganda of like the Germans as being like this gorilla and you know like character, you know, ethnic characters and stereotypes. I mean, there were posters I saw like for sale and posted around town of like Obama as like a monkey, you know, like like doing terrible things to Russia and Russia's this terrible victim. I mean, just really, it was really heavy and it was just wow. This is this is a powerful message and clearly strongly held. So um, and also my last point, then I'll take some questions. Um, I also, around that time, happened upon a protest of people uh, waving this Donetsk flag, and they were giving out literature, and of course I took some, and uh, the literature said, in the Donbass region, in this region, Russians are being killed, babies are being tortured, there's horrible, you know, ethnic Russians are being discriminated against, and, and Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Christians are being beaten up, I mean, just like repeating all of these, um, this narrative of Russians being horribly oppressed in Ukraine. And uh, you know it kind of looked like a protest, but really they were <laughs> presenting the government's opinion and, and trying to get people's attention. Anyway, what questions do you have? Red guy. Um, so you think that, like, like you've heard that Russians 
really want Ukraine to be part of Russia, but do Ukrainians feel the same way? Uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know, but I would have to say no. I mean, I think it, it seems, from what I can tell, uh, Ukrainian, the Ukrainian people generally, first of all, there's an enormous sense of Ukrainian nationalism and this note that you, this feeling that Ukrainian, Ukrainians are separate people with a separate language, a separate culture, and our lives would be better with the West and relationships with the West. Um, obviously, it's mixed because there are a lot of ethnic Russians in, in Ukraine, and, you know, I, I certainly can't speak for all Ukrainians, but I think there's a massive majority of public opinion that wants Ukraine to be Ukrainian. Charge of its own. Thanks. Uh, theater person. How, how similar are Russian and Ukrainian as Like, could you Fair. understand the other? Um, I can typically read Ukrainian and get a sense of what it's about. I can't speak it. But the alphabets are super similar. The, 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 the vocabulary is very similar. Um, uh, the, the differences from a linguist perspective are uh, but uh, I think they're more distinct than like Serbian and Croatian, which is also a disputed. Uh, uh, Creed. Uh, 